Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Q Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, episode 79. Dave, with the salute. From say, the John. NYSC again. <laughs> How are you feeling coming back from Vegas uh, on the UI path? We got the team in Munich for Slowness Sphere. Uh, Slowness Sphere. And then, of course, I'm here at NYSC with Media Week, uh, filming, not streaming, because we got a little lag with the um, getting the captures here, and we're not fully up and running with the streaming yet. But NYSE, Brian Bauman uh, had a great uh, AI leaders event with us, and uh, we held a AI leaders on the East Coast. It was phenomenal. 35 startups interviewed. We had 75 startups total, AI leaders here in New York City, and some from around the world that flew in were in town. So we technically, technically they were in the jurisdiction, so we included them into the event. Uh, but uh, a great, again, great day. And for me, my first in-person IPO happened this morning. Ingram Micro went public. They're setting up down on the show floor behind me for a big party. You probably see people moving around. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but you got Jim Cramer, Mad Money, filming right now. He's live. And so you got Mad Money going on. You got us. Look, at you got the Cuban at CNBC at the same time, Dave. <laughs> they, he actually pre-tapes. Uh, mad money right and then they run it he's like a, they he tapes it like a half hour beforehand i always thought he taped it before like in the afternoon but he doesn't it's just like a half hour before and then they run it he's uh he's down there filming they lower it's interesting because they um i i've studied the production because i'm like where's the mad money set and you pointed it out to me when you were here yeah that it's the wall and mm-hmm. it's a shared wall with NYSE. So during the day, NYSE controls the billboards, like the digital. And then you can see the mad money props, but it folds out. And then a big truss comes down from the ceiling, a remote control. The lights are preset. They pull the stage out. It folds out. And then they put that little thing where it presses the buttons you know, on it. And uh, it's awesome. I mean, it's a really incredible production bye, bye, value. Bye, 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 bye. That one, right? <laughs> yeah. And the sounds come in. It's uh, quite the production engineering CNBC. So, you know, look at I'm excited. We had also Pete Tuckman on. He's the Einstein of AI. I, I mean, Einstein of Wall Street, I should say. Um, he's the oldest trader. He came on for an hour today um, talking about the 87 crash, how he worked through the ranks, the culture at the NYSC, some highlight moments. Um, he talked about when they used to do active trading. You know, you've seen trading places or Wolf of Wall Street or uh, even going back to the Gordon Gecko days, you know, Blue Horseshoe loves Endicott Steel. Um, the, the Wall Street has changed significantly. We've walked through all that. He is like the, 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 the ambassador of the NYSE. And so to get his endorsement, um, and he was very complimentary of the Cube, uh, is a huge deal for us. So I think the Cube has earned uh, great respect here. Um, because they're a lot, a lot like us. They work hard, Dave. They, they're, I mean, the culture here is, I mean, he told me the rule here is just one strike, one strike and you're out. <laughs> you, you can't mean? screw up. Yeah. If you make a mistake, you get fired, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's the long hard, time. It's hardcore. You know, this is because he explained how the traders get badges and that you get it, you get it for life. And you only get it when someone dies or quits or resigns. Um, so um, everyone's vying for these positions. In the old days, it was coveted. You became a millionaire if you were, had that position, um, and which is like a billionaire today. So it's really interesting to get this perspective. But again, he he was very complimentary. And and you know between CNBC and the Cube, our podcast style, uh, long form. Uh, there's no story that we can't cover. I mean, CNBC does a great job. They do an exceptional job of, of news and reporting. Again, their format's a little smaller uh, in terms of the time frame. They're limited by cable, and they do recycle on digital, but they don't have the digital penetration we have. But between us and them here on the floor, there's, there's no story we can't cover in tech, period. Um, I was on Trinity's show yesterday. Uh, the WNBA was here with Liberty Team 1 in overtime. They had the trophy in here. It was a big, big event. It was great to see all the women in, in sports um, doing. We did a whole tech segment on NYSE yesterday live on how AI and technology is changing sports. 
um, Trinity brought up the wearable bra. I didn't bring up that topic, but she did. Since, but since she brought it up, I said, hey, you know, apparel is embedded with devices. And, you know, they're looking at everything now. There's no more halftime adjustments. Uh, it's, it's in the locker room. It's, it's adjustments all the time. Analytics are number one in sports. Micro betting is huge, right? So you're seeing sports take on an exchange perspective. Um, it's really, really tech scene um, is heavy here. And it's awesome because we're here now. And so we get the, every day is like, uh, like the Super Bowl here. It's like playoffs every day. It's always something going on. And as you know, it's just a great environment for our content. It reminds me, John. I got to get your, uh, make sure you're ready for tonight's game. Thursday night football. Get your, your, your match. Okay, okay. yeah, thanks, yeah. thanks for telling me. I'm going to pull it up right now. I'm going to look at the picks. <laughs> Brendan, Brendan, who should I be picking in tonight's make game? Sure you don't have anybody the, playing tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I already, I already gave up on my fantasy team. I don't think I've logged in once. I'm probably in last place. Who knows? I might be up in the leaderboard. Um, I better make my picks in. Vikings or Rams? I smell an upset there. Only three and a half points. Mm. <laughs> mm. Well, John, looks oh. like you're crushing it again at NYSE. Uh, UiPath was great. It was a really good show. <laughs> um, the whole thing was around Act Two. Act One was yeah. up. And Act Two was agentic. And yeah, the team I'm, was all out in Germany. They're they're finishing up. They finished up today in Salonis. Well, well you know, shout out to the shout out to the, the, the Palo Alto and Boston production teams. For getting your stuff up fast the timing of that stream couldn't have been better because as we were filming i didn't have to explain that we weren't live because what brian bauman was doing was he showed everyone we're looking right now like i'm like that's last week <laughs> <laughs> yeah we ran we ran our cxo series on uh tuesday and it got a great reception it's still get it's still baking on on digital on demand. Uh, it was an exceptional performance of the team getting that turned around as fast as they did, uh, shout out to guys on the production team in Palo Alto in Boston. Again, great work. Um, you know, until we get our streaming set up here in the NYSE, we still got to do a little bit of a sneaker net. You know, get that get that drive up uh, to to the team and edit the ISOs. But you know, the button rooms uh, looking good. Going to build that out here. They have state of the art video equipment, but they're a secure enclosed on-premises activity. So they're running all the AV inside the studio here. In, in this one studio, this is the, I'm in the XCNN studio, the one uh, across the balcony is where Trinity and NYSE TV is. And people are getting our model data. They're like getting what the Cube's doing because what's happening is, is that they're realizing that we're the ESPN of tech and NYSE is like the NFL app. And they own the venue. They own this league behind me called the NYSE and they have their own TV operation. So and they don't run any programming that conflicts with us. So they're like the red zone. We run all the deep dive games, the content. And so uh, that is resonating with the audience and the people here at the NYSC uh, and in the media uh, circles uh, here. So, um, so far, so good. I'd say um, the, the content programming and the reception has far exceeded, exceeded my expectations um, and again, we we had such great guests this week. Like I said, we interviewed 35 AI leaders, founders, and, and leaders of companies. The welcome reception at uh, Car uh, Carde, uh, where we had dinner, steak place on the pier, Pier 17. We had 75 people there, um, and uh, big time investors. I think it was two billionaires in the audience, in the crowd. Tons of startups, tons of networking. A real trusted network effect is developing in real time. And uh, again, um, startups setting the agenda for the AI wave. And they're all basically aligning with the fact that our analysis on the research side is spot on. Pre-agentic, causal AI around the corner, um, the shift towards developer productivity and productivity in general, cost versus revenue coming out of AI. So again, all the validation, we're getting new data just to reassert our position on our primary research and fueling this next generation research coming out is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. I got Brian Bauman. We got we have the sneaker. We got the sneaker net over here. There you uh, go, your hard drive. Brian's in the house. Brian, say hello to the team. How are you? Hey, Brian. How you doing? Good all to see you, man. All action all week. <laughs> He's got a, we got a <laughs> guest appearance. I had <laughs> I had, uh, I had a mid. I got to uh, run. I got to dinner right now. All right. Appreciate it. See you later. See you later.
Brian yeah, Bauman, yeah. artist yeah, working man in NYSC. He's definitely put together quite the wire network. NYSC merged their network with us. Um, got the drive, all the content right here for 35 interviews. That'll turn into about 3,000 video clips with our new AI system. Phenomenal. I had uh, Amit Kumar on from UiPath. He runs the industry practices and based in New York. And he was telling me, yeah, basically every year we have our you know banking meetup with our top customers at the NYSE. I was like, okay, well, when you do that, um, April, May. And so I said, let's run a digital twin in conjunction with that meetup. Like, okay, yeah. what's that? Well, that's sort of the model that we're perfecting here. It's just unbelievable yeah. what you've created with Brian and what we executed yeah. on a couple of weeks ago. It's the content's great, John. The, the, the open source, the open source concept, the cube is very compatible with with the market forces. So again, um, I did a live hit yesterday uh, on NYSE TV because the news again. It was they had a ticker tape parade today in New York for the WNBA, the Liberty. Um, so big hoop action. Big buzz. Nike had a big press release out yesterday. I did a commentary on the Nike story as well on on the live segment. Um, they're reinvesting. And look at women's sports is all about revenue, right? I mean, this is something that is talked about a lot, men's versus women. And to me, what's happening with digital is that you have more media exposure developing. And what's happening is as there's more media exposure, that drives the business model of more awareness, the digital culture. TikTok, Instagram will drive more economics. Um, and so I think you're going to see a revenue model kick in for uh, women's sports. This will level the playing field as more the athletes. And as the data gets tracked, one of my premises of my commentary was, you know, the sports fans are getting a lot more out of the data. Fan experience, apps are taking this in. This got betting action going on. So, you know, FanDuel is an NYSE listed company. Um, so, you know, I was talking about NHL just earlier today. Betting is huge. They have betting partners. So, you know, you know, the fan experience has now moved into the where the participation of the crowd isn't just passive. It's active on multiple fronts, using data in the applications for better stats, gambling, micro gambling. Uh, NHL is sending people to the events so they can enter in the scores as close to zero latency. So no one gains the, the betting apps. But who would have thought that problem would be in sports, Dave? Like, I mean, but when gambling was illegal, it was like pick the line, you know, whatever it was at the time. Now you got you can bet on anything. Who wins the face off? I mean, there's so much you can bet on. They were talking about using AI to simulate stats and actually replicate games, all star games, okay, with generative AI. So, so much action happening with the AI uh, conversations that you know, like like we've been predicting on the cube, use cases are coming out of the woodwork. From computer vision to live editing in the cloud to just overall data that we've never seen before now being available for analytics. Again, coaches and teams. I mean, I was talking to the Stanford and um, UNC soccer teams over the weekend, and they were in Palo Alto for a game. They're making game time decisions based upon the wearables in warmups, how fast people are running. This is how good they're getting. With analytics so literally you could be benched if you're not running fast enough so everyone used to be competing for that starting job which was usually a week of practice how they look in practice no 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 how they looking up in warm-ups so they're running game speed simulations aka digital twins to simulate who's got game and making adjustments in real time that's already going on in sports today so you're seeing nfl for instance you know, classic broadcast. What, what do the analytics say? Go for it in fourth down. So you know, we're already seeing it. The data is infecting every vertical, media entertainment, oil and gas, finance. I had a, a guy from an illegal vertical in today. We had a guy in for healthcare doing workflows around billing that like was mind blowing. You know, it would have been like in the weeds, some long project consultant would come in, scope out a schema, do a data. No, they're doing generative AI and managing the the they call revenue cycle a revenue cycle a new buzzword is is emerged where they're basically taking looking at the how their revenue loops are going and once they've been identified those revenue loops get hardened and then ai takes over from there and manages it so they got better ability to forecast probability of claims and reimbursements 
That's like the old accounting. Like, I'll give you a discount if you pay your receivables early. No, they're doing it on things like there's a 90% chance that this X-ray or CAT scan is going to get approved. Boom, that's cash flow. That's real. This is real cash. This is real business benefit. So we are going to see a tsunami of real value come from the AI world, and, and it's already happening. So again, I'm, I'm with IBM on this. We talked about this yes last week. There is no bubble popping in, in AI at all. There'll be a there'll be a air being let out of the balloon, but there'll be no bubble popping. There's too much value of being unlocked on easy use cases. Get on base, we say. You know, just get on get the first base. Get hit by a pitch, take the walk, whatever you can. If you get a double, great, get a double. But just get on base and you're winning. And then from there you just run the bases. That seems to be the AI playbook right now. So a lot. A lot of action. Tons so you action. mentioned computer vision. Um, you saw Anthropic released new Claude models that can control a computer. I was reading that article in Silicon Angle. It sounded very much like RPA. RPA was UiPath in particular. That was there this week. They, you know, they got started with computer vision, and it doesn't look like this capability. This capability is like in preview mode. And it's not that good. But you know, LLMs are going to start being able to control your computer that's kind of interesting and um but you know to your point about you know no bubble you, did you see the andy kessler article in the wall street journal no kind of, i did not kind of negative on ai ai can't teach ai new tricks and uh basically saying if, if you run out of data and you have to use synthetic synthetic data you know it's going to lead to model collapse so he's sort of sort of down right now on 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 llms and he laid out this well, uh, he, well hold on let's just unpack that for a second he, his premise is he's going to run out of data so i don't think that's a good premise now the ability to get data usable that's a different story you know ai will fail if there's no data available to teach it more things so again we had another startup came on here on that point that's just talking about small language models backed by a series a round emergence capital in california they're a new york-based company um, they're basically saying models will talk to each other. They've been following the argentic stuff. Data will be available. Okay. The problem is, to Kessler's point, is that he's talking about open AI and that the large language models are insufficient. And he's right. A lot of the small language models that are either proprietary or data that's on premise or in the cloud by a company that's owned by the company is valuable. But you can teach the AI with your data. It's called grounding. Grounding data is a technique. Um, and if you don't have the grounding data, then you have a data problem because there's no lack of data, there's, in, in my opinion. So and this is where these, these closed loops or these revenue cycle opportunities come in. If you can identify a process that is a business model implication, meaning they impact the business, either more revenue or more cost reduction, you lock it in. And that's going to continue to throw up data. So that data is continuing to earn, more, learn more data. So as you get more data about that revenue, you have then adjacent opportunities to expand the aperture of that of that data acquisition. Uh, because where there's one business model linkage is probably another. So that seems to be the pattern coming out of this week is that uh, the power law is in play that we put out two years ago, one. Number two, models will talk to each other. Okay, they'll talk to each other and reinforce each other and and fuse at some point i think that's where andy might be missing if i understood kind of how you laid it out so i mean what he was we'll saying see. what he was saying in the article is that there's a linguistic apocalypse paradox where ai intelligence comes from human logic that's embedded in between words and sentences and large language models they need human words as inputs yeah. to become more advanced and, and his his premise was that some researchers are saying that we're going to run out of written words to train models sometime you know later this decade or maybe even early next decade and so his point is you can't train ai models on ai generated prose because that will lead to model collapse um i don't know he's saying that the output will become gibberish like he <laughs> He called it like AI inbreeding, I think was the term. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, he gets the headlines. 
But I mean, he's got to factor in computer vision too. I mean, the the computer vision throws up data as well. You can look at gestures, facial expressions, uh, and over time, reason over word combinations. Um, I'm not sure I buy that. Well, I'll read the article. Yeah, take a look. I mean, we've been talking about synthetic data as allowing because let's you know you're going to need more data. But our thinking was that you could you could create synthetic data and then follow the reasoning traces um, of yeah. humans and then and then and then uh, uh, mimic that with synthetic data. And he's suggesting he says here if only one percent of the data is synthetic, it's enough to spoil training models. I don't know. I mean, I this is sort of new information. So read the article. Let me know what you think. I mean, yeah. like you said, it's good good headline. It got some attention in the community. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, when you have these cycles of you, know, you want you want to have both sides of the equation, right? People love to hear what they want to hear, and the anti AI crowd will be leaning into that, saying, "See, I told you, someone has a good argument." Uh, okay, it might be a good argument on paper, um, but the reality is, most people use synthetic data for training simulations, not so much production. So, um, again, that was another thing that came out of this week was. You know, in these certain verticals where the zero tolerance for failure or hallucinations or drift or context poisoning or prompt injections, they will not put any in production at all until it's vetted. So that's why this hardening of these loops come in interesting handy because like that's why small language models get a lot of attention because people having successes with the use cases that are domain specific where they can actually vet the data. Uh, broad sweeping. AI does not work for the enterprise. We know that. We talked about it last week at length. Um, but, you know, Anthropic releasing improved Claude models is a good sign that the industry is doing its job of lowering um, the cost of tokens, increasing to context windows, and also increasing capabilities. At the same time, I met with uh, TensorWave. They're doing an AMD GPU cloud. And, you know, they're going to be growing like a weed because, you know, NVIDIA is dominating the market with core weaves of the world using DGX cloud type technologies, using NVIDIA. And you know, you think AMD is going to sit by the sidelines and, and watch NVIDIA run the table? I don't think so. I think that's a good bet. I think TensorWave has a good chance. If they can get the data centers up and running, they're going to have a good chance to manage service with GPUs. So I like this company, TensorWave. I had dinner with the founder last night, shared some of the plans about their financing and their product plans and they got to wait for the next processor to be shipping but you know they're in line to reduce the power envelope and change the economics of cost now oh, by the way amd brings x86 to the table where compute will suffice for inference on smaller devices and then they also got arm you know, so the arm news with with licensing deal with the, they're, they're pulling back on with qualcomm so you know i didn't dig into that but i did see sarji talk about it on on his his twitter uh uh, this week, uh, this morning, and yesterday, um, that's going to be very interesting. So, a little bit of a chip war is going on here, Dave. It's like there's a jockeying for position. Um, I'm not sure if you have an opinion on that. I, I don't have one yet, but we'll see. Uh, it's I, a sign that innovation is happening at both layers of the stack. You know, developer frenzy in verticals with domain specific expertise, and then hardware performance. Yeah, I mean, the ARM thing is interesting. I, I really didn't understand it and i'm not sure I, I do now but but i thought you know arm was supporting qualcomm but they basically canceled their architecture license um because i guess qualcomm acquired a company that that arm claims um it canceled its license and as a result qualcomm's uh, that cancellation applies to Qualcomm. Uh, the company was Nuvia, which uh, Qualcomm acquired in 2021. And Arm has basically said you got 60 days to uh, come come up with some kind of agreement. So you know maybe this precipitates you know some kind of settlement. Um, but Qualcomm fired back like this is BS. This is. Here's the quote. This is more of the same from Arm. More unfounded threats <laughs> designed to strong arm a longtime partner, interfere with our performance leading CPUs, and increase royalty rates, regardless of the broad rights under our architecture license, is what a Qualcomm person said. 
And uh, there's a trial evidently coming fast in December. So, you know, Arm appears to be trying to get a a settlement for the trial. Uh, but and we'll see. Qualcomm is digging in. And so they bought, yeah. my understanding is they bought Nuvia to, to basically develop high-performance ARM chips that could compete with x86 and uh, and even compete with Apple. And so I think I think the Nuvia team was the former Apple uh, chip designers. So yeah. I, I don't I don't understand why the Nuvia uh, architecture violates the 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 ARM agreements. I, I don't I don't know. I haven't dug into it enough to, to know that. But so I apologize for being more on top of it. But well, you're kind of red eye. You got a little, a little bit of a jet lag going on. You're a you week up the end. Uh, you get, <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now here, today was an exciting day. It was loud. Uh, Ingram Micro returned to the public markets. They took, got, went private, got private equity back in the public markets, raised almost a half a billion dollars, like 400 million plus to pay down some debt. But uh, my first IPO here I've seen in person. So it's fun to see them ring the bell. In fact, I made a newbie mistake that the production team pointed out in my IFB when I was doing an interview that they were ringing the bell um, around 11 o'clock. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it must have been a big trade. No, it turned out that the guy was my, no, John, that's uh, their first trade. I'm like, I should know that. <laughs> so apparently, I, I do know that, but I just forgot. They they rang the opening bell, Ingram Micro, because they're doing an IPO today, big fanfare. But the first trade has to be made by the market maker to NYSE, and that's the difference between NYSE and NASDAQ. NASDAQ is like an electronic bulletin board. There's no market maker, so it's just it just runs on its own. You could, it could vol- be highly volatile where NYSE actually makes the market. And you, you got, a, I think, a demo of this when you were here. But that was their first trade of the day. Where they, they, they rang a second bell, which was the opening of the stock itself. Um, and uh, that's where I kind of got my learning today uh, from from the team here. So yeah, I was again. That was, again, that was well, news well, to me. Uh, but basically, I didn't know this. Nasdaq, when they do an IPO, they they release the the price. They announce the price at a very specific time. You know, 11, 11 a.m. Boom, and then it goes. If there's multiple IPOs on that same day, one goes out at whatever ten thirty. One goes out at you know twelve thirty. And NYSE is different. They actually make the market. They they do like an A-B test, like what if we price it at 26? What's the demand? And what if we price it at 22? What's, oh, the demand goes up. And then they work with the bankers yeah. to determine, okay, what's the sweet spot? When do we want to release this? So it might be one o'clock in the afternoon, might be 11 a.m., uh, whatever. They 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 time it based upon, upon the supply and demand. And so there's still a little bit of you know science and art involved in, in the timing of, of those IPOs and the pricing. Yeah. Cool. Uh, speaking of speaking of money and money matters, um, IBM had earnings. Okay, ServiceNow had earnings. Uh, IBM revenue misses, but the execs were AI is going to fuel future growth. Um, not sure you saw those that earnings day, but you know we had a big segment last week on IBM. Uh, consulting revenue was down, so clearly the earn, the earnings news came after the analyst meeting, which we were all like, oh yeah, IBM is well positioned. Um, any any thoughts about those guys? Yeah, yeah. So, and I listened to the call. Um, you know, they they basically you know, missed the on revenue. They are able to get. They've got operating leverage, but and there's the you know, the good news. Here's the good news. The good news is the software business is humming. Um, it's now forty five percent of IBM's business, which is great, and it drives. I want to say 30% operating margin is what I remember. I'd have to look it up, but uh, so that's very solid and it's a big an increasing component of their business. I think the the annual recurring revenue is now 80% of their software business. So that's all good. Their transaction processing was very strong. What was weak was consulting and mainframe. Remember mainframes surprised. I mean, it's a, they've been at the tail end of the cycle for a while now, but they've still been growing. Well, this quarter they didn't. And so you know, when mainframe uh, does well, IBM often does well, but um, they, they've got new mainframes, new Z uh, systems coming out next year. And so that's going to be a big boost for them. Storage, interestingly, um, which, you know, we've, we've seen a, a, a sort of a rebirth in storage. 
was up. They've been gaining share. I, I think there was up uh, high single digits. So that was pretty positive. The, the, the disappointment was in consulting. It came in, you know, at the low end of the range. I think it grew 1%, which was, the, like I say, the low end of the range. Their guidance, they've, they've lowered the guidance in consulting. And basically, I'm not surprised. You know, consulting is exposed to, you know, the pressures in IT spending. The macro is ne- not favorable this year for consulting. And so that hit them. Um but hit the good news, again, software, and the other good news is free cash flow. I mean, Jim Cavanaugh on the call was really stressed. He said, look, basically he was saying, when Arvin took over this thing from Ginny, he didn't say that, but that's what he was really saying. You know, you had a situation where it was deteriorating free cash flow. It was a, a low growth or no growth, actually. It was a shrinking company. Um, and, and it you know didn't have the margin leverage that it has today. Arvin has turned that around, and it's true. Um, so Tony Saganaga, Tony Sakanagi made, you know, kind of the most cutting comments. He said, look, if I go back over the last four years, you're basically, you know, some things work some quarters, some things don't work some quarters, and you're essentially, a, you know, a, a 3% growth company. Um, why should we expect anything different? And I think they did a good job answering that. I said, look, you know, you're right. You know, some we have a we are a portfolio company, but we've made a lot of new acquisitions. You know, the Aptio acquisition, Red Hat is cranking. I mean, Red Hat grew really, really nicely in the quarter. And so IBM feels like its its mix of products is much more favorable going forward than it has been historically. And I would agree with that, by the way. It's really done a good job of modernizing its portfolio. As you know, John, we heard from Muhammad Ali last week that. You know, consulting is going through a transformation where they're really driving a lot of AI in consulting. And, and so that could eat into, I think he even said this, could eat into revenues because, you know, they, they might be more profitable um, in consulting. But if machines are doing more of the, the labor, that entire business, you know, could be under uh, under pressure just in terms of its overall growth. Remember, I mean, they get paid gobs of money, these GSIs and consultants, for bringing armies of people in. Well, if AI is going to replace those armies of people, you know, potentially the revenue is going to be less, but the cost advantage could be significant. So I think this is going to take some time for that to shake out. But I don't know. I, I'm generally still pretty positive on IBM. IBM, the stock's up, you know, what, up 45, 50 percent this year, year to date. So not surprised that with a little bit of a revenue um, softness that it pulled back. But I, the yeah. free cash flow to me is still the big story for IBM, yeah. and they're on track to do I think twelve billion this year. So I still like. I just, I just got a text from a friend uh, that said, "Check out the New York Times story uh, that's posted today around uh, a source from two thousand and five quoted saying Intel CEO Paul Odolini proposed buying Nvidia for twenty billion, but the board of directors resisted due to concerns over price tag and integrating Nvidia." So there it, there it well, is. Well, you know what? It, it, interesting. You mentioned ServiceNow earnings and Bill McDermott. I saw him on TV today, and they just keep cranking. They, you know, Google um, at one point was considering buying ServiceNow, and they 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 could have bought them for you know, a little north of ten billion. ServiceNow is what are they? A two hundred billion dollar market cap company now. Nvidia is over three trillion today. Unbelievable. So I mean, that's a miss. And Intel sideways. So. I mean, look at, you know, it's a case study, in my opinion, of a fall of an American institution. Um, you know, this really kind of shows you that without reinvesting, you know, had they done that, okay, um, it could have been a whole different Intel. We might not have seen the NVIDIA boom. So, you know, I think the NVIDIA thing, much different consequence than, say, ServiceNow and Google. Yeah, financially, it would have been good for Google, but you know, I mean, look at Intel. It's a collapse. Okay, um, you know, you 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 called it, but this is astonishing data. And if it's true, now, you know, apparently, um, it it wasn't a haymaker because it was written up by you know seasoned veterans. Right? So it's not like it was um, a, a haymaker out there. It was it was written by. You know, Steve Lohr and Don Clark. Don was a Wall Street Journal article, and they teamed up together to write the story. Okay, so they, you know, Don Clark's been covering the chip industry for more than 35 years. 
he, you know, he, he's also known for playing in bands too. Great guy, uh, great reporter. Um, this is interesting. I wonder if he had that in his notes. <laughs> it's like, whoa, hey, I gotta go back to my archive. Who was Paul? Because Paul only has been getting hammered by, you know, by being the CEO that blew it. Well, if this is the case, that's the board. It's a classic innovator's dilemma here, you know, I mean, it, which is interesting given, you know, Andy Grove. But I mean, you know, they 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 passed on certain markets because they were under such pressure to perform. And Intel was, you know, still, it's just a monopoly behavior, right? I mean, you get this dominant position and you're, 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 you're enjoying monopoly-like margins and you see all these other opportunities popping up that, you know, look like re, rebar steel. Ah, let the let the little guys have that. I don't want the low I margin. Mean, and all of a sudden, just, the low margin business becomes the high margin business. It's unbelievable. Nvidia is unprecedentedly uh, a use case where it's like, you, if you didn't see this coming, they obviously did. Now they're just unrivaled on the chip game, right? With AI, I mean, they are the most valuable companies. Uh, one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable company in the world. While Intel just falls from grace. Okay, so you know, I mean, it's classic. You know, Somebody classic. every every monopoly, every hardware monopoly, and you know, the tech industry is, is started with semiconductors. IBM's mainframe. It was the three hundred and sixty architecture is what gave it. You know, in the in the in the compatibility with the code base x eighty six. It was the Microsoft. You know, the Wintel compatibility, and now it's. It's NVIDIA with CUDA right now has the monopoly. And you know, a lot of people think it's short-lived. I, I don't. I think it's going to last for a while. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's interesting. See, IBM, you know, had a good profit, beat on profit, missed on revenue, and the stock got crushed. Tesla beat on profit as well and missed on revenue. But Elon promised twenty, at least 20% growth next year, maybe even 30%. Stock takes off, which is was it intriguing to me because... I was watching Ray Wong on TV on, I think it was Monday. I was working out in my office before my flight and uh, I saw Ray come on. I'm like, and Ray did a really good job. He was on with, um, I think, Joe Kernan. And one of the things he said is, I, I, I really like Tesla. In fact, I like Tesla. I like that. He said, I own the Mag 7. Ray owns all the Mag 7. He says, but I like Tesla better than Meta. And I tweeted out, I, I actually disagree. I like Meta better than Tesla. Well, Tesla had <laughs> the best. Best day in, in, in it's probably had all year in terms of stock price. So I tweeted out, you know, Ray. He said he, he said, Dave, I'll take that bet. And I, I tweeted out, Ray won Dave zero. So Ray was on top of that. <laughs> you know, knowing Ray had some inside information. Ray's pretty connected. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean I, it's interesting because I had a guy came on the cube, okay, here uh, yesterday, who works for um, partnering with ICE. He's a former Goldman Sachs banker, and they're creating an indice, an index fund of private companies, Dave. So um, the capital markets are so frothy for the data versus of the world, the stripes of the world, um, that they want to create indexes for these private companies because there's no visibility on valuation. You know, you and I get calls all the time, uh, people who read our research from the cuberesearch.com, and they want they want information because you know, the only way to change the valuation is pricing around, which we know when you get to the later stages, get pretty crazy, right? So my feeling is you're going to start to see the uh, capital markets get liquidity form formally and have index funds so retail investors can participate. Um, and I also interviewed a company called Silicon Data, a great entrepreneur. She's doing essentially commodity pricing of GPUs and CPUs, meaning com the price of compute. It's like frozen concentrated orange juice. Right? You could, you know, they're going to have data. And she's offered us to give us a widget for our site, but like the leaderboard, like here's the current prices for compute. And I asked her, you know, why are you doing this? Are people betting on this? He goes, well, kind of, but they are, it's a risk management challenge because when people do data center build outs, allocation of supply and two, pricing decisions on costs. You know, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, do an RFP. I'm going to want to buy compute. Um, this is like a big deal. So they're building data sets around these things. The silicon data, that's the price of compute and, and GPUs and XPUs. And then the other one, index of private companies. Interesting. So speaking of private companies, did you see the perplexity news? I'm sure you did. They're yeah, half a billion. Half, 
half a billion dollars in an $8 billion valuation. In January, this company was valued at $520 million. And this summer, the valuation went to $3 billion, and now it's you know hovering around $8 billion if they do this, this round. I mean, that is insane how fast that valuation has grown in a year. I mean, so yeah, I mean, getting I mean you, 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 you brought it up last week and I love, and you and I both on the same page on this. I love super cycles, Dave. I mean, you know, super cycles are like um, unique times in history. And if you go back to 1986 and look at that 10 year period from 1986 to 96, okay. We went from proprietary client server and mainframes to open systems that created uh, an inflection point that drove massive amounts of wealth creation, massive amounts of transformation that set the agenda for what would be the next run up until the web, that next transformation cycle, that super cycle was fast. Now we're in the super cycle of Gen AI. To me, if you're not a winner in the first three years, you're not gonna be the winner. The winners are determined early on. And remember, we we had this long debate about open AI, notwithstanding their CapEx and their lack of cloud, but they're winning, okay? So the question is, in that surge, there'll be other uh, people in the power law at the top of the at the head of the tail. So, you know, I was telling TensorWave last night. These guys are on a path to be the next core weave of AMD. They're like core weave for AMD. Now, core weave made their business on bank, banking on Nvidia. Well, guess what? AMD put the money up for core uh, for uh, TensorWave. So, if you want to, if you're a betting man, you say, "Hey, I want to bet on AMD." Why wouldn't you? Their stock's killing it. They're playing on both sides of the fence quietly setting up a run on, on the GPU and the FPGA with Xilinx. They have the X86 consortium to hold the line on that business. And they're going to go full throttle gas it up big time with GPU clouds. Like, well, hello, the no brainer, right? I mean, if you, if you can get the power, if you can get the data center. So TensorWave guys are data center guys. So like they're going to figure it out. So I like that company. So, you know, you talk about, you know, you're going back to that that period you mentioned, 86 or, you know, to 96. When I was in college, I, I wanted to do computer science, which you did, but Union's computer science program was so outdated. They had this Burroughs mainframe and it just took ever to get, you know, turnaround times. And the thing was just really just horrible. It was a, it was a time, it was, a time sharing back then. It was just awful. So I said, ah, the hell with it. I'm going to just do math and I'll take some, you know, computer science. And by the time I left, uh, you know, graduated in 83, they had, um, you know, we were programming on PCs and, and, you know, assembler, like 6502 assembler was the the Apple II assembler anyway, that we were programming on. Anyway, the point is there was a book that was really inspiring, you know, a lot of us at the time, it was Tracy Kidder's Soul of the New Machine, which was, you know, the protagonist in the book was Tom West, who was like the then, I guess, chief architect or what you'd call today a CTO of data general data general was taking on you know digital and ibm and back then 128 where you know i live was you know the 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 shits i mean it was the place to be in technology but after i graduated and started at idc the book that we all were passing around was this this steve jobs auto not autobiography steve jobs biography it was super inspiring about you know, who he was and how he would, you know, eat pineapple pizza and make everybody who joined Apple take LSD and hallucinate, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but it was, that was the time period when 128 basically ceded the dominance in tech to Silicon Valley, where you live. And so it's kind of interesting uh, that that transition. And now we're going through another wave. I mean, it's very, we've seen them, many of them. And and this one is, I think, as significant, certainly, as the internet. People talk about that all the time. Is it as significant? It certainly is in terms of if the focus, right? Everything, remember when we went to PCs, everything was PC, PC this, PC printers, PC distribution, you know, PC lands, PC everything. And same thing with internet, you know, web this, web that, and cloud this, cloud that, cloud native. And now everything's AI. And uh, so it's the same kind of mental mindset Everybody, every conference we go to, you know, every conference call, it's just such an AI centric world right now. And that that's a there's a lot of disruption. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it's unclear, you know, who's going to make money. Like, how's a, a, open AI going to make money? They're supposedly going to lose 44 billion between now and what 2026. And so, but 
you know, VCs are going to bet and they're going to bet big. And so I, 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 I it's a, it's a, your point. It's the most fun times, you know, the, the dot-com crash, the lead up to the dot-com crash was the, one of the most exciting and fun times in tech industry history. And I think we're going yeah. through something similar to that, although it's just, it's not as wild. It's wild West in a way, but it seems like it's more, mm, yeah. more, more adult. Um, I'll say when, when I when I published the Peter Tuckman interview, the Einstein of Wall Street, who came on today for about an hour, I had extra time, so we did a full hour podcast. The guy's got a huge digital footprint. He he mentors people. He's been a longtime trader. You've seen him. You met him. Um, he talked about the Yahoo stock here, and so he and and we talked about how you know people get up on their high horse in Wall Street and get knocked down, <laughs> punched in the face. It's like it's a culture of when you're winning big. Everyone's a genius in a bull market, but the bear markets define the winners, right? Really long term. And he talked about the Yahoo price and how, you know, you know, the uh, the senior traders they constantly traded and they took their profits off the table, but it went up to four hundred, then back down to three, three dollars. Yeah. I mean, so Yahoo was a riser and faller. So that dot com bubble crash created massive amounts of wealth, but if you didn't take money off the table, you were screwed. And so. Um, there's a lot of that experience here. He also talked about uh, some of the dark times. And I asked him, and he goes, you know, what's been some of your experience? And he brings up WeWork, right? He talked about WeWork. And we've, I don't know if you've seen the movie WeWork, um, the documentary on WeWork. I think it was on uh, either HBO or one of the uh, over-the-top uh, no. channels. Um, it's about the guy who was the, about the real estate work. So I don't know if you remember, but remember they pulled the IPO the night before, dude. Yeah. Do so, so, so I go, okay, so what was the big stain? He goes, John, IPOs don't get pulled the night before. It's a big lead up. And um, he said, I go, so what was, what happened? He goes, well, he was promoting all this stuff, but, but he goes, when you come to the wall, when you come to the exchange for the day before, you're completely the emperor without any clothes. You have everything exposed. And so when they realized he was on doing uh, cocaine and hookers, look, direct quote, he said, he was totally out of his mind. <laughs> it's freaking fraudulent. They, the NYSE pulled the stock. IPO was canceled the night before. Now it's a huge ceremony. Okay, um, that was cool. And the other, the other moment he said that was um, uh, an experience that he'll never forget was a positive one. When he worked his way up from a runner, he told me the different progression. I don't remember exactly what it was, but back in the day, when to get a broker number like he has now, you had to go through multiple steps because back then there was no computers. It was like you run the, the order, you get the, the buy, and then you send it back, goes in those little tubes to the accounting department, seven days later gets reconciled, money changes hands days, weeks later. He goes, he goes, but I had to work my way up. Um, he goes, I got lucky I did it in three years. Normally it takes normally it takes 10 to 13 years to get that progression from a runner, clerk, and all that stuff that the the pre the pre position. Um a guy died, so he got it, right? So he told me about the, when you get it, because it's such so old school here back in the day, they open up the book. It's like the mafia, dude. Like open up the book and you sign your name. And in that same book is Alexander Hamilton, okay? Every single person that traded here is in the book. It's like, you know, the book of Santa, he called it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it was, and and uh, I I kind of smiled. I kind of smiled because it was like a historic. I never really looked at it that way, but it was a big deal. And then apparently they have a hazing ritual here for traders, where all the traders are in on this first trade. So once he gets his his license, he has a trade to make. So everybody, even the client, is in on it. So he had to buy IBM. And I think it was, it was trading. He had the number. He remembered the number. And so he was told by the client, go buy me uh, 50,000 shares of IBM at this price. And so he goes up to make his own trade. Okay. And everyone's in on it. And he's trying, and the client gave him specific instructions. So wait for it to do that. Uh, so he was just being sandbagged. He had no idea. This is the hazing ritual. And then finally, he ended up buying it. That was 25. He said 25 was the number. You wanted that 24 and a quarter. He ended up getting at 25. And then by the time he walked back to his trading station, it dropped back down to 25 and a quarter. They basically gave him the price to screw him over right? <laughs> as a hazing ritual. 
Um, <laughs> so I go, hey, at least they didn't you know, get you in a headlock and give you five punches to the face. Uh, that's what they did in my neighborhood um, in Catholic school. But it was funny. It was just it's just all these inside stories. So you know, I'll, I'll publish that next week. But he wants to come on all the time, so he's going to be a regular guest. We'll do more storytelling there. But that yeah, was a fun cool. story. I mean, the sign the book. Uh, Culture there was amazing. My college roommate and one of my other best friends from college, cut, did, they went through that same kind of hazing on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> but I remember, I mean, they had a, they they both moved out of the city because of the the lifestyle was, you know, the the bell would ring and they would go right to the bars, you know, and they would start they'd be drinking, they'd be smoking, and, and, and that's how they wine and dine their sell side clients, and they did that every day, all day, and it was just a. He also he also shared another story that reminds me of, of how we run the cube, which is like our culture, which is like he's like between nine and four, no matter what happens when you go home the next day, it's you can we'll go out to dinner, what happens on the floor stays on the floor. And you know, like when we run our productions, you know how it is. It's like it's 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 always on. He he calls it every day is a Super Bowl here. And and you know, there's contentious conversations, right? People get into it, right? Like, you know, yelling at each other. Um, and then Trade disputes, when back in the old days, they called it questionable trades. You had two choices. It was a, a um, an adjudication committee of five people on the fifth floor or some floor here. You go up there and you plead your case, or you flip a coin on the floor. Loser pays. Right? Like, like that was how things got settled. <laughs> it's kind of like buying someone a beer. Oh, I'm okay, flip a coin. Uh, get me next time. Um, so now... That's key. And then the other moment he mentioned was 1987. Remember 1987, Dave, I was in college. I wrote a paper on this in college about high frequency trading, how computer systems are going to you know, change the structural dynamics of that. And he told me that there was a three-year impact to 1987 because computers were screwing up their fine-tuned process of manual drudgery. That was the board of the ticket. Like I said, they had two sets of books, the trades that were going on the floor and then what was going back to the back office, a total lag. And then, you know, they would, so sometimes it'd be a questionable trade. No, you agreed this and I bought it at that. And, and these are big trades. These aren't like little, you know, buying a share. It's like big numbers. So this is what the process was pre-1987. In comes 1987, welcome to computer trading. There it is. That's And then, and now he then equated generative AI to that 87 moment. So interesting perspective, a historical perspective, I said, Peter, you're like me and Dave. We're like historians. You're like the historian of uh, NYSE. He's the ambassador here. So, again, a lot of funny stories. Again, great week here. Again, media week. You know, we'll get the content out as fast as we can. But you know, once we get our, our our connections to our studios, we'll have this stuff turned around much faster. Um, but uh, great to see your stuff hit today. I mean, this week, Tuesday. Um, that got a lot of attention. So. Um, Look good. Again, all good stuff. I was pleased that uh, I mean it's hard work what you're doing down there. I did it too. It's like it's like a cube gig plus, you know. Uh, I mean, it really is a grind, but it's fun and it's great yeah. content. I'm I'm really pleased. I'm getting my I'm getting my steps in for sure. Um, but it's <laughs> a great lo great location. I love the balcony. This is the XCNN studio, our studio in the button room would uh, will be built out. All good. Uh, it's about time for me to call it a day, day Dave. It's been uh, Walt Brian's like John. How you doing? I'm like, dude, I got another hour podcast with Dave. We're gonna rock for another. Like, oh, you're a, you're a journeyman. Yeah, I said, look, I'm gonna go as long as Mad Money goes. It was you know, yeah. does Kramer does Kramer do 35 interviews? I did. Uh, Kramer interviews works pretty hard though. You see, he does. Yeah, I give I give that guy credit. I think he's in his 70s now. I I've told you, hard. he was one of our first clients. Wall Street clients at IDC, really probably the second or third. Yeah, CNN, CNBC, they do a great job. They have a big crew here. Again, their production values are phenomenal. Their set's big, right in front of the bell. Um, you know, they have the number one um, position. We're number two now, um, so that's awesome. And uh, you know, again, we're the first podcast style on the floor. Uh, I'm surprised uh, no one thought of this in the past, but it's all good. Um, and, uh, and a lot of other media that come in during IPOs, I did notice that today was a heavy media day um, than normal. Why? Um, so who's there? Like, like Cheddar's there, Schwab Network's there. 
Cheddar Studio is basically not operational. They have maybe one person comes in uh, one time. I saw one person there. Schwab Network, uh, Nicole, she runs full time there. She runs a show. She does a good job there, um, catering to the Schwab audience. It's kind of like you know Schwab Media. Um, that's like Schwab TV. It's like member member Dell TV, kind of that kind of thing. So it's really catered to the Schwab. But she covers the market, um, and then that's it. And then you have FinTech TV. They do a good job, and then but they they're doing more cable targeting. They're targeting the cable networks um, mainly. Yeah, over like the, the top. They, they do good work. I, I, uh, so so the that's guy? the sto- uh, those are the standard people. But today, Trinity had an extra segment yesterday and today because of the WNBA ticker tape parade that went on today. They came in, rang the bell yesterday. Today was the Ingram Micro IPO. So when the IPOs go on, media comes in that covers them. So there's a whole set of uh, outlets that co-locate Trinity Studio, and they, if they are overbooked, they'll overuse ours. So we had to, we lost the uh, uh, ten spot. We only lost one one time spot. So ten to ten thirty, I lost my ten o'clock uh, spot. Ten a.m. to I don't even remember the public. It was a name that I, I didn't recognize. Uh, it was it was it was a financial thing, IPO. So you know, I'm there was the NYSE guides um, talking about the IPO listing, the process. I mean, basically, it was the cube for IPOs. Very, very, uh, very targeted content. Lost that because we don't have our our dedicated studio fully built out yet. We, we've okay, well, when we get that studio built out, we'll be we'll be full full control. Full control. Right now, we use NYSC's awesome equipment, uh, but their control point is the studio on the twelfth floor. That's highly secure. Um, and then until we get them um, sending the signal to our studio, it's it's going to be. Um, uh, sneaker net with the with the drive so yeah all good well dave um enjoy your get a good night's sleep i'm sure you'll hit the hit the sack i'm hey, sure well, you'll have a good night's I'll sleep definitely hit the sack. I, didn't, I didn't sleep well on the plane and uh so but uh but it was a good thing i wasn't drinking so it's, i feel all right feel like <laughs> well we'll see you next time i'm going to be popping into boston i'm going to be back in nyse for november 7th um, I'm going to meet with SAS is going to come on the cube and a bunch of other interviews when I could keep building on since this New York uh, ecosystem is uh, really resonated with cube signaling, got a great getting tons of LinkedIn action. Uh, and then, you know, shout out to the team. Then I'll be back in Palo Alto and then off to the events. So I've got a couple of big events coming up. So KubeCon okay. and uh, supercomputing. KubeCon, you got supercomputing. I got the Dell analyst event, the Dell tech summit. We got, um, Let's see. We got obviously reinvent at the end of the year. We have uh, also the Veeam has a, a, a their big analyst meeting out in Arizona that I'm going to go to, and I think I'm going to go to Supercompute this year, John. I think I'm going to go down to Atlanta, hang out with great. you guys. And uh, awesome, cool. Well, hey, you have a great night, and let's wrap that up. Go to SiliconAngle.com, go to Cube.net, the CubeResearch.com. A ton of amazing principal research has hit. The Agentic stuff is on fire, getting a lot of good feedback on the work uh, you guys have done there and the team is doing. Um, our coverage and our analyst notes that I've been putting up to get good feedback. The Economist article was referenced three times this week, the ones we wrote on that special digital twin edition of the print edition uh, that uh, you and George Gilbert wrote on behalf of the Cube Research. Um, great stuff there. And again, Causal AI, Scott Hebner, doing some great work. And again, just continuing to pound it away. Rob Streche, Christoph, uh, Bob, all doing great work. So and go to the cubeai.com if you want to see our language model in action. I've been a prompt. It's a new feature. You can listen to the answer, Dave. You see that? Go to the Cube AI and you type in a prompt and you can actually listen to the answer. I haven't seen that. I was in there the other yeah. day. I didn't notice that. Yeah. And it's looking a lot like perplexity to me. So, I like that. I like okay, that. we'll so, see you next time. Complexity is going to start taking ads, which uh, is interesting. I bet you, I, I, I bet you, we're getting more, more and more traffic from perplexity these days. Not more than Google, but I bet you it's starting to rise. I, I we're seeing, right we're seeing them pick up our real time feeds. It picks up all of our live streams and events. And again, uh, awesome stuff. I'm going to go. Got my picks in. I picked the Vikings, and uh, I got my pick in. I keep on forgetting that I'm on the East Coast. Oh, it's five o'clock. I better get my picks in. Oh, I got two more hours. Come more hours. <laughs> um, so you, I'm used to five o'clock. Is like the my my hair gets up. Oh my god, I'm gonna miss my pick. It's I don't want to leave 16 points and spot the field uh, uh, on my pool. So 
appreciate the heads up on that because I would have probably forgotten, Dave, if you didn't tell me. So thanks for rem- reminding me of my pick. <laughs> All, right, All right, we'll right. see you next time. And uh, thanks to the crew. Thanks for pulling it together on Thursday. And uh, see you next time.